Good morning or afternoon, whichever time zone you're in. Uh, I'm Lynn Shaw. I am one of the co-managers of the uh, vegetable area in the uh, Montgomery County Master Gardeners. Uh, we're here in uh, uh, Conroe, Texas. And I'm going to talk to you today about spring vegetable gardening. I guess the first question everybody has when they do gardening is, why do you want to garden? What's, what's your motivation for gardening? Um, some of us just love it, okay? And that's, that's all there is to it. We may have, have acquired that from our grandparents or our parents or somebody else, but we just love to garden. But most people do it because they want the produce. They want homegrown vegetables. They want to know where their vegetables come from. Um, they taste better. I mean, there's nothing like a homegrown tomato. You know, that's one of the, the biggest things that we all crave because tomatoes go through so much processing. They're um, refrigerated in the grocery store and they just don't taste like a tomato. So homegrown tomatoes are really great. Uh, the other thing you have control over is you have control over all the pesticides you use. If you want to spray them, every day, then you know what you've sprayed. If you want to be organic, you can be organic. So you have total control over what's on your vegetables. Uh, it's wonderful exercise. Uh, you're lifting, you're walking, you're bending. There's a lot of, uh, of physical exercise to gardening, but it's really good exercise. And you might feel it the next day, but it's, it's pretty great. And of course, it better be fun. If you're not enjoying it and it's not fun, then find another hobby. Okay, to be a green thumb gardener. Now, today I'm going to talk about things that you probably have already heard before if you've been gardening a while. If you're a brand new gardener, then I'm going to tell you some of the, the beginning things that you need to know about. So we're going to start with some of the beginning things. And to be a good gardener, you've got to know some basic stuff. Uh, and one of those things is uh, the moisture content that you need for your plants. Vegetables don't like to be drowned. They don't like tons of water, but then again, they don't like to be dry either. They just have to have adequate moisture. Uh, adequate moisture, we, one of the uh, techniques or tips I'll give you is to use your index finger and uh, to, the, to the first knuckle is about an inch and you put your index finger into the soil and if it's dry, you water. If it's damp or wet, you wait a day or two and try it again. So that's, you want enough moisture that your plant can survive, but you don't want to drown your plant. The other thing that people don't think much about because a lot of us like to grow uh, the same thing every year, uh, but we still need to rotate our crops. And I'm going to talk about that in a little more depth because a lot of people don't realize what that means and how to do that. Uh, so crop rotation is important to for your plants to be healthy and to not have a lot of um, bugs and common diseases in your soil. Uh, the third thing you want to know is how uh, when to plant and when to harvest. Uh, a lot of people, when they start out, um, they'll plant either too soon or too late. In Texas, it's, it's common to plant too late because we have uh, some really, sometimes really warm springs. Now, this year, we had a really late freeze, and boy, did it do some damage to all of us. So if you had started your vegetable garden in mid-February, you're starting over again because we had some really bad uh, weather for about five days in a row. Um, so there is a chart that is on our website that uh, will tell you the, the general time frames for when you need to plant every single vegetable. And if you stay within those time frames, you'll be pretty successful. Sometimes you can vary it a couple weeks, either earlier or later. Like this week, we're going to have 83 degrees, which is kind of warm for early spring. Uh, so we may be able to bump up our schedule by three or four days looking out 
I always look out around 10 days to 14 days for the temperatures. And if I see a common trend that we're going to be in this, you know, 70s uh, or, 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 you know, low 80s, um, then I might bump things up a week or two. Uh, if, if it's going to be quite cold and we got nights in the 40s, well, then I might wait um, because they don't, they don't, most vegetables don't like to be too cold or I will wrap them, which I'll talk about that too. The other thing you need to know is what kind of varieties grow well here. Uh, our varieties are quite different than they are in the Northeast. Uh, we have to have varieties that can handle our heat, can handle all the bugs we have, although hopefully this year it won't be quite as bad because we had a freeze, and, uh, and handle the, the volume of rain we get. We get a lot of rain all at one time. So we have that chart also on our website. And um, I suggest you look at it. Most times at our plant sales, we try to sell those varieties. And some of the, the bigger box stores work, sell some of them, not all of them. The, uh, the next thing you got to decide if you're just doing this from the beginning is you got to decide where to put it, where to put your garden. What is the best location for your garden? Well, the best location is one that gets full sun. And even in the sun, and even in the um, uh, later part of uh, summer, you still need a lot of sun for vegetables to grow. Um, eight hours is, is the requirement, and that's a lot of sun. Uh, that means that you don't have dappled sun, you don't have shade. Sometimes you can grow leafy greens, like spinach and lettuce and stuff, with six hours of sun. But most vegetables require eight hours of sunlight. So you want full sun. You want it in a well-drained area. You want an area that um, is raised. That's why they suggest that we do raised beds, uh, because you want that area to dry quickly. You don't want your vegetables to be uh, submerged in water for any period of time at all. But you also need it near near a water source because they they require constant. It's kind of like us, right? We get used to eating at certain times of the day and drinking drinking plenty of fluids. Well, vegetables are no different. They want consistency. They want something to to happen. If if you're going to water, mornings are always really good. And you need to do it consistently every day unless it rains. So you want to be near a water source. And the most important part of gardening is that your garden is visible to you. You know, even if you just walk around the house, you know, once a day and look at it, you'll catch so many problems right away and be able to solve them uh, if it's visible. If it's, if it's out on acreage that you don't live on and you only go out there um, periodically, then you're going to have a lot more more trouble with your with your gardens. So location is important. Um, the other thing is important when you're when you're determining where your location is is where um, the trees are. Big trees, uh, the the common uh, uh, root spread of a tree is one and a half times the height of the tree. So for me, that's a big problem because I have 60 foot pine trees all around my house. So pretty much there's nowhere in my yard that I can have a garden in the ground because it would compete too much with the trees and the tree roots. So you want to be aware of where those are. Now, you can raise the garden bed and have it like a waist high garden where it's not on the ground. That works really well, but you want to be sure that you're not uh, competing with the tree roots. Uh, both trees, roots, and weeds compete for soil nutrients, weeds especially. It's kind of interesting. After our freeze, all our other plants look dead as a doornail, but boy, the weeds are growing like crazy. They are just happy as can be. So weeds will grow almost under any conditions. And so you've got to get those weeds under control and make sure that you're not putting your garden in an area where it's going to have to compete. Uh, the other thing you want to do is to try to control diseases on your plants. So you want to 
trim the leaves off the ground. You know, a lot of times when we get rain, the leaves just start drooping. And when they droop and they touch the ground, then you get a lot of splash up from your soil. And that's a sure sign that you're going to have diseases. So trim those leaves off the ground. You may have to do that multiple times. Uh, the other reason for trimming is also to improve the air circulation. If you have good air circulation around your plants, then you'll have less diseases. And then thirdly, you need to check for insects. And if there's just a few, hand pick them off. Get a pair of gloves and hand pick them off and drop them in a bucket with soapy water. Or if you're vicious like me, just squash them. <laughs> so pick off the insects or spray them if you've got a lot. Uh, I try not to spray unless it's just absolutely necessary, but sometimes, and I'll talk about some of the insects that you might have problem with in a few minutes. Okay, ideal soil. Um, you know, our soils are so important, and around here we have a lot of gumbo, um, and it's so difficult sometimes to know what you need to add to your soil. And you don't want to just throw money away by buying, uh, you know, all this uh, fertilizer that you don't need or, or adding amendments to your soil that you don't need. So the best way to determine if your soil, what your soil is and what you need is to get a, a soil test. And in a minute, I'll, I'll kind of explain how you do a soil test. The form up there is the one that you can get off online at Texas A&M uh, AgriLife. And uh, you can fill it out and take your soil sample and send it in. And they will uh, analyze your soil and come back uh, with a report that will tell you what you need to add to your soil and what kind of fertilizer requirements you might have. Uh, pH is a, is a measurement. It's a measurement of acidity or alkalinity. And it, it goes from 0 to 14 with seven being neutral, right in the middle. Uh, most vegetable gardens want a little uh, acidity. They want it slightly acidic, so six to six and a half is what you're looking for uh, in your pH scale. Uh, if it's too acidic, then phosphorus, which is an important uh, nutrient for your soil, can become toxic and it restricts the uh, soil bacteria in your garden, and you don't want that. Uh, in, in both uh, a little west of Willis and over in Cold Springs area, uh, they have quite sandy soil, and sandy soil tends to be uh, more acidic. It's really great for blueberries. Blueberries like acidic soil. They like 4-0 or 5-0, but most other vegetables want a little bit less uh, acidity. So it depends where you live, uh, where what your soil is going to be. To amend acidic soil, you can add lime to raise the pH. It's fairly short-lived, though. When you do that, you may get one season out of it. You may not even get that much because it it uh, doesn't last long in your soil. Uh, if it's too alkaline, it what will happen is it's going to impede a lot of the micronutrients. So your iron, your magnesium, copper, zinc, um, those will be bound up and they won't they won't be accessible to your plants. So you you don't want it to be uh, too alkaline either. Uh, one thing you can do to an alkaline soil is apply elemental sulfur and a, or a aluminum sulfate. And you can buy those a lot of times at uh, the feed stores and things like that, or a gardening center sometimes has them. You've got to reapply it, though. That's the, that's the important part, is to understand that you can't do this just once and have that be the end of it. You have to reapply it uh, every few years. Uh, one thing that uh, is helpful to your soil is organic matter. And organic matter is usually uh, referred to as compost. Uh, and it will actually add a lot of nutrients to your soil. Uh, it'll, it'll add, um, the soil will drain better. Um, it, we strongly suggest that your soil be 5 to 10 percent organic. And you can easily add that before you plant and mix it in 
and uh, and then go on. Uh, we add organic matter to our beds uh, every year um, because our beds have already it it decomposes very fast, and uh, so we we add it every year, and it really does help our soil a lot. The other thing you want is you want uh, what they call pore space, which is about 50%. And what that is, is the, the spacing between all of your soil, where air can go through, water can go through, and microorganisms can, can uh, uh, be active in your soil. So you need that. One, one way of adding some, if you're having an issue with that, would be to add perlite to your soil. Uh, that's why when you see potting mixes, they typically have perlite in it, and that's what it's doing. It's adding pore space in there for your for your soil. Uh, and lastly, your texture of your soil is important. You want a little bit of sandy, or what they call sandy loam. So you want a little bit of sand in your soil. It helps your drainage, and it just holds everything together uh, really well for you. So soil is important. It takes a while sometimes to get your soil right, unless you just happen to be lucky. Uh, I'm from the Midwest, and boy, we just had beautiful soil. I, I doubt that they ever amend anything other than adding some fertilizer, because it's that rich. It's just a good black soil. We don't have that down here. <laughs> I haven't seen it anywhere. Okay, taking a soil test. There is a... a, a, a a better way to take a soil test so that you get a, a better result when you send it in. If you take a, a trowel or a sharpshooter or even a shovel and you cut a six inch um, slice, basic or deep divot in your soil, um, that will get you deep enough in the soil to get a really good feel for how your soil is. You'll, you'll throw away that divot, and then behind that, you'll cut another uh, one-inch slice from the back of the hole. Uh, that will give you, and then you put that in a bucket or a bag or something like that. And you want to do that eight or ten times all around the area that you're wanting to plant in. So if you've got an acre, you're going to wander around a lot. If you've got a, a small bed that's only six foot by three foot, uh, you might not even have eight or ten spots to do it from. So it just depends on how large your, your area is. But the more you can do, the more um, uh, you'll get a little bit of every area and it will all mix together uh, in your bag. Uh, you want it air dry in case if you're doing this when the soil is really wet, then you want to air dry it first. And then you want to add two to three cups of that mixture into a resalable plastic port bag. Um, You've got to fill out the form that you're going to get on from online, and uh, it will give you information on payment and where to mail it. And that should do it, and then you'll get your report back in uh, a few weeks. Uh, talking about soil moisture again, you know, we we all have the problem of overwatering. Uh, and I know I do in my own yard because I'll forget a day and then I'll go, oh, my goodness, these pots are really dry. I need to really water. But overwatering is just as bad as underwatering. So you really do need to do that uh, knuckle test I told you about. Put your, your finger to the first knuckle and feel if it's if it's already wet or not. If it's not wet, then uh, water. And if it is wet, then don't water. You always want to water the roots. You don't want to water the leaves. Um, the leaves are where you're going to get a lot of diseases. And so if you leave wet leaves to dry out, you'll, you'll have a lot more diseases than if you uh, will be careful and water the roots. One of the things we suggest and works well for us here at the extension is to use uh, a drip line or a soaker hose. And this picture shows both. The one on the left is the uh, uh, soaker hose. And then the one on the right is a drip line. And the one in the middle is something we used with PVC and cut some holes in the bottom of it. Uh, and it just, but it sprays right at the roots. It doesn't, it doesn't spray at the, at the uh, uh, plant level. So something like that works. Now you can always hand water, but again, when you're hand watering, you see how hard it is for 
to water just the roots. Your, your tendency is to water the uh, leaves. Fertilizers. Uh, I get a lot of questions about fertilizers. And I, I guess it's because there's so darn many on the market. I mean, they're, they're every shape, size you can imagine. But fertilizers have three, th three labels on the top. They're N, P, and K. And it stands for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Those are the primary uh, ingredients that uh, most plants need. Fertilizers work due to water. So you don't want to put a, a granular fertilizer down next to your plant and not water it in because it, it won't do anything until it rains. And by then it may have evaporated or you may have lost it. Um, one thing I need to tell you is nitrogen, what it does for your plant is it promotes growth. That's it's really important. And you need nitrogen on your plants the entire time. Most most vegetables are 60 to 90 days and, and you've got to put nitrogen on them routinely almost that whole whole entire time because nitrogen evaporates very fast. You know, six, seven days and it's it's out of the soil and gone. Uh, phosphorus is the flowering. Um, it, it causes flowering, uh, which is also important, but a lot of our soils have plenty of phosphorus in it. So for vegetables, you really don't need a high number of in the phosphorus area. Uh, potassium is for the strength of the plant. It also facilitates um, flow of nutrients in the plant. And uh, that's needed, but not at the level of nitrogen. So uh, fertilizers, as I say, come in every shape and size. And what it will tell you on the bag is what percentage of that bag is each one of these. So you might see on the bag that uh, 13, 13, 13. That means that 13% of that bag is nitrogen, 13% is phosphorus, and 13% is potassium. And all the rest of that bag, even if it's a 50-pound bag, is all filler. It does really nothing to, to feed your, your plants or, or anything else. Um, let's see. Phosphorus. Okay, I think I've talked about all of that. The thing you want to do is to, uh, to realize that it takes water to put those nutrients in your soil. And you're really only focused on the nutrients in the first three to six inches of the soil because that's where your uh, your roots are. That's where you want the growth to come from. So you don't need to, you know, put put the fertilizer 12 inches down. What you really need to do is put it on the side of the plant and then water it in really good, and it will seep down uh, three to six inches into your soil. One thing we typically will do is we'll put all the phosphorus and potassium in if we need it uh, before we plant, because then you can mix it in really good with your soil. And then we'd only use about a quarter to a half of the nitrogen uh, when we plant. And typically we side dress, side dress that. Uh, two inches below the seed is ideal area if you're, if you're going to be uh, planting or, or seeding, the seed doesn't need the, the fertilizer to germinate. The seed's going to germinate without it. But the minute after it actually germinates, it does need fertilizer. So if you put it in when you plant, uh, then it's there when you need it. Uh, you want to surface side dress again, the, the remaining nitrogen. So if you've used only a quarter in, in the bed, then you want to side dress the rest of it. And small frequent amounts are best, no question about it. Uh, that means that you're going to be out there more often, but you can't just fertilize at the beginning, walk away for six, seven weeks, and then expect your plant to be uh, happy because it hasn't had anything to eat. Uh, here's the average content of most horticultural plants. Uh, if you see vegetables, which is what we're talking about today, the average is about a 3-1-2 ratio. Uh, so, as I said earlier, most garden 
um, fertilizers are even numbers. 13, 13, 13, 20, 20, 20, 10, 10, 10. Uh, most gardens don't need that because they already have enough phosphorus and, and potassium. So they really need more nitrogen than anything else. Okay, one, one example I'll give you just on fertilizer before I get off of that is Osmocote Plus is, uh, is just a, you know, one of the name brand uh, fertilizers. But what's interesting about it, it's a, it's a 15, 9, 11 fertilizer. So it's, it's about the ra right ratio of 3, uh, three one two. It has also micronutrients in it. It has magnesium, sulfur, iron, mag manganese, boron, uh, copper, and zinc, which are very helpful for your soil. You can get those in other ways, but if you can find it in your fertilizers, that's you know that's a win-win. So if you will look for that when you're looking for fertilizers, that that would help you. Okay, crop rotation. Crop rotation is, is uh, the concept that you don't plant the same family of vegetables in the same place every year, that you move it from one place to another. So, for instance, um, the nightshade family, which it consists of all the things that we love for summer, which are tomatoes, potatoes, eggplant, corn, peppers, um, they... Uh, need to be rotated. Now, sometimes if you get three crops in Texas, which a lot of us try to, we try to keep the, the crops uh, uh, always going out here at the extension, uh, you're okay because it's, even though it's only been since last year that you did a tomato, you didn't do a tomato for three crops. So you, in essence, rotated in a different way. You haven't rotated year to year, but you rotated uh, that is the every fourth planting. So that sometimes works too. The other reason for crop rotation is, believe it or not, this first uh, year that they have all those I just read, plus cucumbers, melon, and squash. Cucumbers, melon, and squash are, are of the same family. Uh, they're in the per cubit family. And they have the same some of the same diseases and the same bugs as the uh, nightshade family. So if you plant a uh, tomato one time and the next very same season, or very next season, you plant a cucumber, all those bugs that love tomatoes are still in your soil and are they gonna be on your cucumbers? So that's the other reason for rotating the, uh, the best you can. Some, you know, farmers rotate in a way. They, they put cover crops in between. They may plant tomatoes every year or they may plant uh, corn every year, but they do a cover crop in between. And that's a, a method of, of rotation. So it's really important to, uh, to do that. There's a lot of these charts on the Internet that you can see that gives you the groupings by family. A couple I'll highlight will be like the um, the carrot family. There's not too much else in that family, at least vegetables anyway. So uh, uh, that's a good one to be one of your rotation crops because it's unique. Uh, corn family is another one. It's in the grass family. And there's not a whole lot of, of other uh, vegetables in the grass family. So... Onions are always good as a rotating crop because they tend to drive some of the bugs away. Onions or, or, or something, uh, even garlic, those kind. So crop rotation, very important. Okay, here's just a, a schematic of how to direct plant. Uh, most people kind of know how to do this, but here's here's a methodology that will help you. Uh, you want to you want to Water in the area you're going to plant before you start, just a little bit. You don't have to you don't have to put a lot of water, but you want some water. That's going to help the seed stay in place once you get the seed there. Uh, and then you want to sow the seeds. Now you can do that in little like they have here, little furrows. Some people like to, to build it up and do it on the top. Um, either way works. 
but you really don't want the seed moving around on you. That's the important part uh, when you actually water in the seeds. You don't want to put seeds too deep. Typically, the guideline is uh, one and a half to two times the depth of the seed is what uh, you need to put soil on top. So it's not very much. It's usually a quarter inch to maybe a half inch for the bigger seeds like beans and things like that. Um, so you don't want to put them too deep because if you put them too deep, what happens is it takes forever for them to get to the surface. And um, they may die before they even get there if you put them too deep. So broadcast them fairly uh, shallow. You can use a rake like they have in this example where you actually rake out and kind of uh, disperse them with the, with the rake, uh, especially if you don't want them in a straight line. Uh, and then you rake both directions and that helps uh, so you don't have to do as much thinning. Because one of the big things, like if you're doing carrots and lettuce, those are tiny, tiny seeds. They are just so small. And so it's really hard to just, you know, space them accordingly. You know, lettuce may need six inches between it, but you can't get your hand on those little tiny seeds to do that. Uh, so if you if you end up with more than you need, then the best way to thin them uh, is to take some scissors and just snip off the one you don't want. Don't pull it because if you pull it and try to transplant it, you probably won't be successful and you you'll disturb the roots of the other ones that are, are growing well. Okay, transplanting outdoors, which is what most of us do. Some of us are, are lazy and don't want to start it by seeds and we want to be sure that we got a plant that's that's good and healthy. So we actually buy it, buy it at our plant sale or we buy it uh, at, at uh, nursery and we come home and transplant it. You want a good healthy plant. You want it to be six to eight inches tall if possible uh, because they've already got a, good, a lot of growth on them. Uh, you want it to be a good green color. If you start seeing damaged leaves on it, uh, and unless it's just environmental that because we just got a cold snap or something like that, uh, it's probably some kind of disease and you don't want to put a diseased plant in a, in a especially in a hole that you've worked so hard to get the soil right. Uh, so make sure it's very vigorous and, and, and uh, green in color. Uh, make sure that it's not pot bound. What that is, is if you pull the plant out and the roots are just wound around in circles, you don't want that. <laughs> That's not good. That means it's been in the pot way too long. Uh, if possible, get one that's not flowering. Uh, I know it's it's tempting when you're doing tomatoes. If you see a tomato on that plant, you go, oh, my goodness, that's I know it's going to grow tomatoes because it already has. But that's not a good thing because it's going to go through transplant shock. And uh, so you really don't want uh, flowers on your vegetable plants. You want them healthy so that you can promote the flowers instead of uh, having to have it go through shock. If you can put it out on a cloudy day, that's perfect. Uh, because and windless day, uh, because it will won't have to go through any stress. You know, if you put it out at three o'clock and it's 95 degrees outside, it's going to go through a lot of stress. <laughs> it's not going to be too happy. Um, windless days in March sometimes are hard to find. We get a lot of wind, uh, and so that's even harder to find. But what you can do is you can you can cover them with some row cover or something that will prevent the wind from having a big as big an impact. Um, and then you want to put about two inches of water in the planting area uh, before you seed. I also would would water the plant itself in the pot that it comes in because that will hold your roots together. Uh, if it is a little root bound, it's OK. You just you just start pulling the roots a little bit away from the soil a little bit uh, before you transplant it. And then uh, you cover it if you can for a couple weeks. Um, now we, when we do our tomatoes and things, we will actually put row cover and cages on them when we plant them, the very first thing. And, and we'll leave it until the plant reaches the top of the cage. Um, that keeps some of the bugs away also, but it protects it from the, from the wind in uh, March and April. Okay, so now let's talk about uh, warm season vegetables. 
Uh, we have a, a big selection of vegetables that we can grow here uh, in our, what we're considering our warm season. Now, our warm season is not summer. <laughs> That's our hot season. <laughs> and in, in, in our part of Texas, it's really hot. <laughs> so warm season, we're talking about March, April, maybe early May if we're lucky. Um, although I understand it's going to be 83 this week. So we may not, we, we may go right into uh, summer faster than we'd like. Uh, so March and April are your best planting months. Uh, this chart shows the families that each of these belong to. So we already talked a little bit about nightshade family. Uh, we talked about cucumbers and uh, squash, I think, but also cantaloupe, honeydew, watermelon, pumpkin. That's all in that family. Uh, beans, uh, the legume family. We have your snap and your pole beans, uh, English, uh, and your southern peas. Southern peas do really well in the summer here. Uh, or lima or soybeans or jicama. We've grown all of those, and they do they do quite well if you plant them in when the soil gets a little bit warmer. So um, in this week, we're going to probably have warm enough weather to to start beans, and definitely uh, next week if we, nothing happens. So we're gonna we're gonna give that a try. Your grass family is your sweet corn, and uh, your mallow family is your okra. All of those do quite well here. Best time to plant is when daytime temperatures are in the 70s. You know, that's perfect planting weather is when the daytime is a little bit warm, but not real warm. So we've had that pretty much this last week. We've had, uh, uh, I think it was 65 one day, but uh, it's been perfect, perfect growing weather right now. Uh, tomatoes are my favorite, so I always love to talk about them. Uh, they, uh, and, but you got to get the right tomato. I mean, that's the bottom line with Texas. Is the what we're calling totally terrific tomatoes means that these are tomatoes that year after year do quite well if we have the right environment and the right conditions. Um, you know, having floods in may sometimes affects us uh, and we've had that before uh, or having cold snaps you know can can affect your tomato growing but some of the common ones that uh, we we will be growing at our next plant sale or we've already grown actually we'll be selling them at our plant sale uh, our celebrity that is a, a, a determinate tomato and i'll talk a little bit more about what that is what determinate means but uh, but it does well in the ground. It does well in a pot. Uh, it tastes pretty good. I think it tastes pretty good. And, uh, and it's uh, an all-American selection from, from a long time ago. It's been around a long time. Uh, big beef is another one that is an indeterminate. And again, I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but it, uh, it does quite well in our area, and it grows for a longer period. Uh, Dixie Red is one that we've just started growing uh, the last two or three years. It does quite well in our heat, which is amazing, and uh, and tastes pretty pretty good too. Heat Master is known for being heat tolerant, and uh, it does well. Chef's Choice is a new. Uh, there's a whole lot of different Chef's Choice. They've got uh, a green, a black, a red, a pink, <laughs> every color uh, tomato you can imagine. And uh, they tend to be a little sweeter than some of the other tomatoes. And they do, they do pretty decent here. And then we got a couple of heirlooms that, that uh, we've had pretty good success for. They're, they're not real big heirlooms like a brandy wine. They're probably more like a, a, a six to eight ounce uh, tomato. Uh, but black semen and Cherokee purple are both do pretty decent as far as heirlooms. Heirlooms are difficult because they just don't have disease resistance. And we have every disease there is here in Texas because of our heat, humidity, water. I mean, you name it, we've got all the, the uh, ingredients that make it hard to grow, uh, grow tomatoes without diseases. Uh, Champion Hybrid's been around a long time. 
and they have a bush variety and they have a, a indeterminate variety. And then Juliet and Sun Gold are both, Juliet is kind of a, a plum, um, sorry, grape shape. And Sun Gold is, uh, is a regular cherry tomato. And all of those do quite well. And you can find, I think, pretty much all of them at our plant sale this year. Here's some pictures of some of them. The black semen is quite beautiful. That's the, that's one of the heirlooms. Uh, purple Cherokee has also got a kind of a purplish uh, tinge to it when you open it up. And then you see the sun gold and Juliet's and celebrities and Roma. Roma's or uh, Viva Italian, I think, is one of the other varieties, are the paste tomatoes. Those are the ones you use for, for uh, tomato sauce. Okay, determinant and indeterminate. I, I, it's important you know the difference between these because they have totally different growing patterns. Determinant is um, grows to a certain stage, maybe three to four feet, and then you get all the blooms and most of the tomatoes all at one time. And, and it's more bush-like. It, it has more of a bush characteristic in its growing season. Uh, and as I say, all the fruit pretty much comes at one time in three to four weeks. Doesn't mean that it totally stops, especially if you have a long growing season, but you'll get a lot of fruit and then it will do another burst of growth and then you'll get a lot of fruit again. And then, uh, and then sooner or later, it will just kind of stop, stop growing, especially when the heat comes on. Tomatoes like temperatures 55 to 75. We don't get that very often. Um, so by the time we get, they like to bloom at 80, uh, 80 degrees, but we're, our 80s kind of just zip right into our 90s. And then all of a sudden you'll, you'll stop seeing a lot of the blooms and that's because it's gotten too hot. Uh, if you can wean it through that period, you can start again in, in fall, but uh, it's kind of hard to keep it alive and keep it healthy. Uh, determinants might, they may be early, mid, or late season uh, tomatoes. Most of the ones that we recommend are early because you want to get as many tomatoes as you can before that, for our, before our heat hits. Uh, and determinants you, you can do in containers or in smaller gardens because they just don't get as big as your indeterminates. The indeterminates, uh, instead of being more uh, bush type, they tend to be uh, more vine type. They'll, they grow um, suckers, which I think I'll show you that in a minute. And they, they will, um, at the end of each little growth thing, they will, they will put out uh, fruit. So you may get three or four tomatoes on one, and then it'll keep going, and you'll get three or four over here. And it will keep producing tomatoes throughout the whole season. But again, our season sometimes is short. Sometimes our season ends when our temperatures get in our not, uh, upper 90s because it um, uh, indeterminate aren't too much different than determinate when it comes to heat. They still like those temperatures to be uh, 75, 80 degrees and not you know, 90, 95. So, but the indeterminates, if you're um, not going to can and you're not going to eat, you know, 20 tomatoes at a time, the indeterminates might be better for you because you get a smaller volume, but they continue to produce longer. Uh, okay, staking versus caging. Um, and this goes along with our determinants and indeterminates too. You want to um, do one or the other. You definitely want to do one of these things. Caging works a little better with um, the determinants, um, but we find that caging works better, period, because of the wind and everything else, it holds the tomato up better. When you stake, you can put more tomatoes, you can put them closer together. But that's about the only advantage to staking because you got to be careful how you stake it, that you don't damage the, the uh, stem of the plant when you're trying to wrap it and hold it in place. And of course, the wind can really be a, a factor uh, on staking. The caging 
you want to be sure the cage is big enough and you want to, uh, and usually that's about three foot to four foot um, width and about, most tomatoes need about five foot in height um, or more. So, and they're a little less work than the, than the staking is. Uh, the staking you have to continually wrap and, and take care of, whereas the cage, they'll just grow inside and that's fine. Now, suckers, that's what a sucker looks like. In between two growth periods, you'll have another uh, leaf growing in here. In an indeterminate tomato, you can cut those off and start a new plant if you want. But mostly we trim them off. And why we trim them off is so that the fruit we do get is bigger and, and it's not quite so unwieldy. So, how do I get rid of this thing up here? Okay, um, how, to, how to plant a tomato plant? Uh, there's a lot of different ways, but we found a couple ways to be most successful. And one of them is to, well, first start with a vigorous plant. We've already talked about that a little bit. Put some complete fertilizer in the hole like they've done right here. Um, and I'm, I suggest you mix it in just a little bit uh, so that if by chance you end up with the stem down in there, uh, that it doesn't burn it. And if you use a slow release fertilizer, then you can be assured that it won't burn it. Uh, so that's, uh, that's suggested. And then you turn the, the uh, let's see if I've got a picture of that. I think I do, there we go. You turn the tomato on its side. So you see these nice, nice roots here. You basically take it out of the pot. It's already been watered. You've mixed in the soil, you turn it on its side, and you just lay the leaves carefully uh, on, the, on the ground. And you can dig a little trench if you want to, a little bit, but not much. You want to pick off the bottom leaves. So I usually go at least, uh, well, I usually go all the way up to where it's going to touch the ground. So at least six inches, maybe more, depending on the size of the tomato. And what will happen is that they will grow roots everywhere that stem touches the soil. And what it does is it gives you a much sturdier tomato. Uh, it will support, you know, more leaves on the top uh, without falling over. Um, so it really does uh, does a good job. I mean, and, and what's interesting, I love to show this to uh, new gardeners because when you do this, you think, well, wait, the leaves are on the ground. They're going to get diseased. They're going to get all these things that you just talked about. Well, they aren't because what happens within, especially if the sun's out, within a matter of, of 30 minutes, the plant will head towards the sun and it will pop right up and the leaves will be above the ground. And uh, what they didn't show here, they showed that this was the stem, but they didn't show that they cut them off. You would cut off these, all those leaves because those would go underneath the ground. And then you'd have a, a much sturdier um, tomato. Uh, slow release fertilizers. There's a couple examples I'll give you. Uh, cottonseed meal is a slow release fertilizer that we use. And it's a, a 604 as far as um, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So it doesn't have much phosphorus, which we like because uh, we don't need phosphorus in our soil. Uh, MicroLife is another one, and it's 624. Um, some people like worm castings. Uh, they, <clears throat> they do really well as a, as a slow release, and they're 200. And then one of the others is Osmocote, but it's 14, 14, 14. It's, it's a little bit higher and everything, but it is slow release, so you don't have to worry about, about burning the plant. Uh, hardening off plants, I don't think I talked about that. That's one thing you want to do when you buy a plant. 
especially if you buy it for a greenhouse. I mean, even ourselves, we've started putting our plants outside because we're going to have a plant sale coming up. Uh, so we try to, to, if we can, harden them off before you get them. But I'd always suggest you leave them outside for two to two two days to a week most, um, because that gets the plant used to your environment and to the outdoors. All right. Okay, now we're watching them grow. Now we've seen that the, you can see the tomatoes here in these cages. And they're, of course, that's probably after, uh, oh, at least a month, a month and a half of growth. But you can see how big they're getting. And now, once they start growing, after the first week when you've done the slow release and planted them and everything, then you want to start using uh, nitrogen fertilizer. Uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, and you definitely want to be sure that you put nitrogen fertilizer on when they fruit. Because when the fruit sets, that's that's when you really, it really needs a lot of um, nutrients. The, uh, uh, the frost cloth that we have on here, I think this is actually a uh, row cover, but both work well, will protect you against frost if you use the frost cloth to two or three degrees, it's not gonna prevent, you know, if we had a freeze like we did a few weeks ago, it wouldn't protect it from that, That would nothing would protect it. But it will protect it to, you know, if you have a light frost, like it hits 32 for a few hours, uh, it would it would protect it. And of course it protects it against winds, wind and insects. One of the things that we use for a nitrogen fertilizer is called ammonium sulfate. You uh, usually can find it at feed stores, sometimes at the at the garden stores. Uh, it's uh, 2100, so it's it's pure nitrogen. It's not doesn't have any phosphorus or potassium in it. And we side dress with that. What I mean by that is you put it to the side of the plant uh, about uh, two or three inches away from the stem of the plant. You don't want it on the stem because this is a chemical fertilizer that will burn uh, and you water it in really good. And But it provides uh, nitrogen right to the roots of your plant in no time flat. All right. Okay, now let's talk about peppers. Peppers are another common vegetable that people like to grow in the summer. They like uh, a little more heat, um, not hot, but a little more heat than uh, uh, even your tomatoes. So they'll, they'll produce uh, pretty well up into probably June, sometime in June. They will take a break in July and August when it's super hot, and then they'll come back uh, and produce more when it cools down a little bit in the fall. So sometimes if you're lucky and don't have any diseases, peppers, can you can plant them uh, in April and you will have peppers uh, until, you know, October. Um, so they're a good crop. Uh, some of the sweet varieties that, that we've grown and, and do pretty well here are Big Bertha and Orange Blaze. Uh, Mad Hatter. Mad Hatter is an interesting one. It looks like a looks like a hat, and it's much smaller than say Big Bertha or Orange Blaze. But they're really sweet and they're very colorful. It's a I don't think I put a picture of that one, but it's a it's a really pretty plant. We'll have that at our plant sale. Uh, sweet Purple uh, that does pretty well here. Red Knight, uh, Banana Peppers, and some we have this smaller one called a Lunchbox. But those are all the sweet peppers that do well. Sweet peppers, of course, take a little bit longer to, to produce and to change color. If they, Most of them all start out green, and then they'll change to an orange or a red or a purple color. So they take a little longer to, uh, to grow. Um, the soil needs to be about 65 to 70 degrees before you plant peppers. So our soil after that freeze is probably not quite that yet. I would probably wait until uh, mid-April maybe. If we start getting 80 degree days, then the soil will start warming up 
uh, faster. That's one, as I say, you can plant peppers a little later than you do tomatoes. Tomatoes, if you waited tomato grow or to plant, you probably wouldn't get any tomatoes in, in our normal year. Uh, again, it takes uh, a high nitrogen fertilizer. It's part of the nightshade family. They pretty much all take uh, high nitrogen fertilizers. And they always say, I, I never get around to it, but they always say to remove the first fruit. And if you remove the first fruit, then it produces better and the fruits become larger. So if you can catch that first fruit and take it off your plant, then you'll have a, a little better uh, uh, production. Hot tomatoes, um, some love them, some hate them. Um, they have, um, well, they're hot for one thing. <laughs> and, and some people can't handle that, that uh, heat. But one of the best uh, jalapenos we have is called Mucho Nacho. It's a nice, big, fat jalapeno. Tastes really good. Produces well. Uh, another uh, jalapeno is down, it's called Early Jalapeno. And it's about, I've, I've tested them next to each other. And you get production about, two, if you plant them at the same time, about two weeks earlier with a Early Jalapeno than the Mucho Nacho. But the mucho nacho goes pretty much through the summer. Now, some people go, well, I bought a hot pepper and it wasn't hot. Well, in May, it probably won't be hot. It, it's going to might have a little heat, but not much. But by June and July, it's pretty hot. Once it once the temperatures get hot, then the pepper uh, gets hotter. Uh, Thai hot is a, quite a hot pepper. It's a very attractive plant. And it kind of grows, the peppers grow upright. They grow on top of the, of the leaves and not out to the side. So it's a very pretty plant. Um, and the serrano is used a lot for salsa. That's a good, good plant. And then some of these others are just a little unusual. Of course, one's a poblano, which is an ancho. Um, and uh, the chili patine is, is one that we call the bird pepper because typically birds run around and plant this for you. <laughs> it's a little tiny pepper and it's super, super hot. Uh, fish pepper is another one that's super, super hot. And uh, flaming fair, I think is fair, flare is fairly um, new. I, haven't, I don't think I've even tried that one. So there's a lot of different peppers. Uh, if you stick to the tried and trues, you, you'll have pretty good luck. Now, what makes peppers hot? Well, it's something that they traced to a guy named Scoville. He created this heat index uh, way back in the 1900s, early 1900s, <clears throat> and it was a measurement of the hotness of the chili pepper. And uh, how they did it is they diluted the pepper extract in sugar water. And when there was no longer heat, available, then that was the, the lowest Scoville unit. So zero to 100 is like your bell pepper. There's really no heat at all in a bell pepper. And then the scale would, would uh, increase based on this dilution. So by the time you get to um, uh, habanero, it's pretty darn hot. It, it's right up there. And of course, the, the uh, Carolina Reaper, um, that one just has no taste. It is so hot that it'll burn your burn your tongue for for weeks on end. My husband tried that once. He loves them, and he tried it just plain. He says, "Oh, I can eat this," and he just bit into it, and he had no taste buds for about four days. So he didn't ask for that one anymore, and we never grew it again. <laughs> Eggplants. Okay, that's another common um, summer. Um, summer, spring, summer uh, crop for us. And um, there's all sh shapes and sizes of eggplant. Some people love eggplants, some people hate them. So it depends on how you cook them and what, what you do with them. Uh, we actually like them and we eat a lot of, of uh, eggplant. The black beauty is one of the common ones. It's a big black, I don't guess I have a picture of that one, big black egg, eggplant that you see at the grocery store. Um, and Nadia is similar. I think that's the one we're going to have in our plant sale. Uh, it's very similar to the Black Beauty. 
The one that's the most unique that you won't find too often in a grocery store or in uh, uh, probably in very many of your greenhouses even is called the LA Green. And the reason being it's an heirloom uh, and uh, we save our own seed so we can grow it. We've It's pretty hard to find seed for this particular uh, eggplant. But what I like about it uh, is that it, it holds up really well. It doesn't have a lot of seeds. It holds up in cooking. It doesn't get slimy like some of your eggplants that people don't like. You can grill it. You can slice it and grill it, and it's really, really good. Uh, so we will have that at our plant sale. I actually have an L.A. green plant from last year that is still alive because I took it in my garage when we had the freeze, and it's getting ready to bloom again. So... Some of these, now granted, I don't have a lot of sun in my yard and it's in a pot and all those things, but it, it's, it's a, it, it hangs in there. I mean, it's a, it's a keeper when it, when it comes to plants. It's a, for, especially for an heirloom. It doesn't get a lot of diseases if you watch it and, and take care of it uh, pretty regularly. It, it thrives. Uh, again, they like uh, this warm weather I was talking about with peppers. They'll, they'll produce really well. And then when it gets super hot, like when we get in our 100 degrees and upper 90s, it's going to stop producing too. It'll stop blooming for a while. But then again, once, once you get back into fall again, it'll, it'll, start, uh, it'll start producing again. All right, nightshade family. Let me just preface this by saying the nightshade family gets almost every disease possible. And every insect possible, but um, there are ways to to uh, to defeat it. You just have to be very diligent to do that. Uh, tomatoes are one of the worst. They're susceptible to something like 16 diseases out of 21. Uh, so don't feel bad if you get diseases on your tomatoes. It's it's very common. But if you get a tomato that has a lot of disease resistance, like a celebrity, a big beef then you you're at least have a fighting chance to, to grow it. Early blight is very common. It, it, it is those miscolored leaves you see there. Um, it happens uh, early on usually because of, of our weather conditions, either a lot of rain or, or a lot of wind or something like that. Uh, splash up, all of that cause will cause that. Um, blossom end rot is most common. That is a calcium deficiency. And when you get that on your plant, uh, that means that plant needs, needs more calcium. Uh, there is a product, uh, I probably didn't write it down. There is a product that you can buy. I think it's Bioneed bi 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 Nide. Um, it's called Rot Stop, I think is the name of it. And uh, you can spray it on your leaves and it gets the calcium right to the plant immediately. There's a lot of other methods that people have tried, you know, like uh, calcium and eggshells. OK, well, it might work, but it sure takes a lot of eggshells and you've got to get them very finely ground and you've got to put them in water. And it takes a long time before it is absorbed by the plant. So by the time you go through all of that, your plant is probably well on its way to a lot of blossom end rot and a lot of, of fruit that you're going to have to throw away. Um, I didn't mention, but early blight is a fungus. Uh, so, and I'm going to show you some products you can use in a minute here for some of these. Tomato hornworm, he's my favorite because I just love picking him off and squashing him. Uh, he is, he is, a, yeah, it is caterpillar. It's caterpillar from, uh, um, I can't remember what, what butterfly it is, but it, uh, it looks just as ugly as you see there. It's green and it's got horns. And before you know it, the thing has, has gotten six inches long and just as fat as can be. It will eat a plant in overnight. I mean, just eat every leaf in sight. Um, so you want to look for those guys. 
they they happen to come usually early May is when I see most of them. Early May into mid May, uh, that must be when the the, uh, the eggs are being laid. So if you get him, don't bother to spray him. Just get your hands uh, with some gloves and take him off as fast as you can get him off. Okay, because spraying him while, by by the time he's six inches long isn't going to do any good. Uh, stink bugs. Oh boy, they're <laughs> they are a real problem. Uh, and what they do, both stink bugs and uh, well, I'm going to do leaf-footed bugs because they're they're similar in how they they uh, destroy your your tomatoes. They uh, pierce the tomato and uh, suck the juices out of the tomato. So when you start seeing tomatoes that just don't they look mishap and and they just don't look right and they've got a, a funny color to them more than likely you've got stink bugs or leaf-footed bugs. They come in groups. You normally don't find just one. When you find them, you know, you may have hundreds. We've even seen thousands in some of our beds out there where we weren't here, you know, every day to check them. And boy, they uh, multiply extremely fast. So you want to take care of those. You're probably going to have to spray them. And even then, you may not catch them. If you can catch the eggs, that's the best thing. If you see little white dots on your, your leaves, either underneath or on top, uh, just squash those. There's not, a, there's not a, a bug that leaves that that you want. Uh, and then cloudy spot or cat facing, um, that is, um, that happens when uh, it's environmental, when, when you have maybe too much heat or some inconsistent moisture or something, um, that's what the tomato is telling you is that you, you've got an environmental problem. It will outgrow it usually if you start, you know, with your regimen of, of making sure it has water every day and not too much <clears throat> heat. There's not much you can do except to try to leave leaf cover over your tomatoes to protect them from, the, from the, uh, the heat. Here's some pest control methods for stink bugs and tomato hornworm and early blight. Uh, the only one that we've used extremely successful it might be early blight. Uh, most of the others, by the time you start to use these, it gets, you know, it's, it's pretty hard. They've already invaded. Uh, but spinosad, perithrum, neem oil, those are all organic. Uh, I use neem oil a lot because it takes care of fungus as well as bugs. So it's kind of my, my go-to when I need things. Uh, we do use BT. Uh, that's the one on the hornworm. Uh, but we use it more for small worms uh, than we do for tomato hornworms. Tomato hornworms, best way to... Just find them quickly and just take them off because they usually you don't have multiples. You usually have one, one or two hornworms on a plant. Um, and of course, insecticidal soap is uh, and BT are both organic. Okay, uh, beans. Beans. It's about the right time now to start planting beans, either bush beans or pole beans. Uh, you want to do a, a March, April planting or, or for fall, a September planting. Uh, you need moderate soil fertility. It doesn't take a, a whole lot of fertility. You don't have to fertilize beans a lot. They'll, they'll take a little bit, but you don't, it, they don't require it. Um, the big thing about beans is when to pick them. People tend to not pick them at the right time. They maybe leave them too long. You want them when they're tender and young. So you want the pods to be, um, depending on the bean, probably six to eight inches. And you don't want to see the, the seed developing inside them. If you start seeing the seed develop, then it's probably past their prime and uh, they may not be as tender as you would like. Um, all the, almost all the snap beans, pole beans, lima beans, all of them grow quite well here. Um, you may get a few diseases, but they're not, they're not too bad. The other one that grows really well here is southern peas. Uh, 
a lot of people don't like them because they're hard. You know, it takes a lot of work to to appeal them because there you are taking the little pods out of the uh, inside. But you can plant them as late as um, August, actually. Typically, we use that as the, the summer crop for us. Uh, once we're finished with maybe our tomatoes or our peppers or, or um, our beans, we'll, we'll put southern peas in our beds. Uh, they kind of fill the gap so we don't have a lot of weeds, and they uh, grow really well in our heat. They like a warm soil, so that's why we always plant them you know, late May, maybe even June or July, depending on what we've got growing. And uh, normally, the, most, most of these, like uh, purple hull peas, uh, will turn a little bit either a yellow or a little purplish color. Uh, and that's when you know, and you'll start seeing the, the, the pea develop inside, and you'll know that they're ready to pick. Cucumbers and squash and melons, all of those do pretty well here. Um, they, the thing they don't like is they don't like a lot of humidity and rain. So we try to do them as early as we can so that because by the time it gets to late May, that's when we tend to get our, uh, our downpours that causes, uh, causes the humidity that they don't like. Moderate fertility, so uh, they don't need to be fertilized quite as much as your tomatoes. You know, they're easily trellised. Most of them will grow in on anything. And if you want to grow, we typically grow ours on trellises. And even melons get pretty big, but you put them in pantyhose and tie them up on your trellis, and they'll they'll do just fine. Uh, winter squash. Sometimes we do the same. If we've got some really big winter squash, we'll actually uh, tie it up. When you uh, want to pick these cucumbers, it depends what kind they are. You know, you've got small cucumbers that are used for pickling. You've got um, the slicing cucumbers, which are usually six to eight inches long. Then you've got some that are even longer. There, there's, there's the uh, English cucumber. Um, there's a Japanese cucumber that are, are quite long. They can get a foot to two foot long. Uh, so it depends on the cucumber, what you're growing, when you would want to pick them. But normally you want to pick them when they're fairly small because they haven't developed the seeds and you don't want a lot of seeds in your cucumbers. You want a lot of, of fruit. So that's uh, the best time. Winter squash you want to do when the rind gets hard. When the rind gets hard, then more than likely your winter squash is, is matured. Winter squash doesn't mean you grow it in the winter. It means that it stores well in the winter. In Texas, that may not be true because <laughs> we, we don't really have the temperatures for storing winter squash that, uh, that maybe they do up uh, further north. But uh, winter squash grows fine here in the, in the spring, uh, or you can grow it in the fall. Uh, melons, uh, the <laughs> it's really hard to decide when a melon is ripe. Usually I wait till the raccoon gets it because the raccoon knows when the melon is ripe. But if that doesn't work, just watch to see if it easily slips off the vine. If you can just touch it and it comes right off the vine, then it's, uh, then it's ripe. And try to get it before the raccoon does. Uh, the common diseases of, the, uh, of this family is uh, powdery mildew, which you get a lot when we have uh, heat, the humidity hit as well as the rain hit. Um, and that, um, it's not gonna kill your plant probably unless you have a really severe case, but it, it is, uh, it's unsightly. <clears throat> and the leaf is not as healthy when it gets it. So you probably wanna prevent it the best you can. Uh, the other big one that we have in this family, especially with our squash, is the squash vine borer. And this middle picture shows the, the um, caterpillar um, or worm. That is that is the guy that causes all the damage. But the mother over here is the moth. This is a moth that flies in the daytime. 
we've we've chased it around the gardens many times to try to catch it. He, she's uh, she's very smart, and she uh, very active in um, in the month of May. Very active, and she lays eggs on the uh, on the leaves. And if you can catch the eggs, then you uh, got a fighting chance. But if you don't catch the eggs, then it becomes a uh, a caterpillar, and it it goes right down the stem of the of the plant, and and kills it. And so you may look at that plant one day, and it's beautiful, and it's got beautiful leaves, and everything looks very nice. And the very next day, all of a sudden, the leaves are drooping, and the whole plant's dead. That's how quickly it it happens. Sometimes you'll see the vine borer's uh, damage on the stem of the plant. If you can catch that and, and dig it out, that, that works okay. And then you just bury the rest of the, uh, the leaf, I mean, the, the stem of that plant, and it will, it will grow over it and it will continue to grow. Sometimes that's hard to catch. But this down here is... Uh, some things that people have tried and we have tried it. I can say it didn't work. <laughs> it, it may deter some, but most of these moths are smart enough to know. Supposedly it's a reflective uh, aluminum foil or they have a, uh, another name, I've forgotten what it's called actually. I just know it didn't work and it was expensive. Um, and it's supposedly if she sees a reflection of that, she goes to another plant to lay her eggs. But it, as I said, we didn't have much success when we tried it. We tried it for a couple different years, a couple different products, and it we still got uh, uh, vine bore. Squash bugs, you know, I talked to a little bit about them on uh, the tomatoes. This is kind of what they look like. They're, uh, they're fairly ugly, and they come in groves. You know, you're going to see a lot at one time. So uh, they don't kill the plant, but they can damage your, your fruit pretty bad. Uh, and that's what their eggs look like. So if you see either the vine borer is a little white egg, and it's, I think it's on the top of the leaf, if I remember. Uh, and then the squash bugs are usually on the underneath of the leaf. And they're a uh, kind of a brownish, brownish, blackish color. Um, I, I'm of opinion that there, most eggs that are, are showing up on any of my vegetable plants are probably not good things. And so I just try to take off all the eggs. Um, because typically your your butterflies and the things you want eggs for, they they don't they don't bother vegetables. That's not their host plant, and they don't they don't go there. So, and those are the only ones I care about. <laughs> Rest of these uh, I don't want around. Okay, corn corn is uh, planted in March and April. Now, from our experience, April is a better month here. Uh, our, our March soils are a little bit, stay a little bit cool usually for corn. So either late March or early late April is usually better because you want it to germinate. If it doesn't, if the soil's too cold, uh, it won't germinate. Uh, the one thing you want to do about corn, corn uh, <clears throat> cross pollinates, and that's what you want it to do. So you want to be sure you use the same variety. You don't, you don't want to get different varieties or you're going to have misshapen corn. Uh, you also want to do at least three rows across so that it can easily cross-pollinate because it cross-pollinates in, in the uh, wind. So uh, if you don't have a big garden, it may be hard to grow corn because you, you, you need that. Now, I have grown corn in a square foot garden. And what you do is you just make sure it's on every square of the foot. So you've got at least four, and then I would do two or three uh, squares of it. 
and it will cross pollinate and you'll get some corn. You won't get a lot of corn because you don't have very many plants, but you will get it. So you can you can do it other ways um, if you don't have, a, you know, say a, a six foot wide bed so that you can get that cross pollination. Let's see. Uh, it it you want to use um, nitrogen on it when the um, tassel is uh, starts. That's when it starts developing the corn, and you want to you want to really fertilize it uh, at that point in time with with a nitrogen fertilizer. And then you normally harvest corn when it's in the 90s, um, which for us, you can be harvested. It depends on how soon you start it, but we we usually harvest corn early June. Uh, that's usually about the time frame that it's ready if we if we're able to get it in in early uh, April or late May. There's the there's the tassel. Uh, okra is another uh, plant that people either love or hate. Uh, because of its sliminess, um, but it does wonderful here, and it's a good summer crop here when hardly anything else grows. Uh, you can plant this as early as April. We typically will wait and do it late May or early July even, uh, because it's usually a second crop for us once we get the other stuff uh, harvested. It uh, likes warm soils. Sometimes it's a little hard, if, especially if the soil isn't warm, to um, germinate. If you have trouble germinating it, then soak it in a little water first and then, uh, and, then, and then put it in the soil. It's moderate when it comes to needing uh, fertilizer. It doesn't need a lot of fertilizer. It, you could use a little bit when it's getting started. You want to harvest the pods when they're small. <laughs> that means don't leave town because you'll be harvesting it every day. Um, it's amazing how quickly those pods go from, you know, a tender three, four inches to a huge seven inch <laughs> a woody stalk. So definitely um, be prepared to harvest it regularly. But you can do a lot with okra other than, uh, you know, than just cooking it. You can, a lot of people can it. Uh, it's a really good can or pickle it. Um, you can grill okra on the grill. We grill a lot of stuff, uh, and it's it's quite good. And it doesn't it doesn't it loses a little bit of that sliminess when you when you cook them like that. Okay, we're almost done. Uh, we have two plant sales coming up. We want to let you know about one is the vegetable and herb one, which is next week, March sixteenth and seventeenth online. You order online and then you pick it up. Uh, the uh, that Saturday of that week, the 20th, I believe it is. And we're going to have all these, uh, uh, hopefully all these vegetables and they're looking pretty good. Here's that Mad Hatter I was talking about. Isn't that a pretty plant? And, and you'll sometimes you see an orange, orange uh, color too. Uh, then our next, our big sale that we always had in the spring is also going to be online this year. And it's uh, April 13th and 14th online. And then the pickup will be that weekend, probably two or three days that weekend, depending on um, the volume of people that we have. So we hope you can attend that. Uh, here is all our resources uh, that you can get in touch with anytime you need information. Uh, Aggieholderculture.tamu.edu. You can find it. They've got a great section on vegetables, uh, both spring and fall. Uh, they've got guidelines on a lot of the vegetables where it tells you not only uh, the kinds of vegetables, exactly how to plant them, when to harvest them, how much to fertilize them and all that. It is really great handouts. Uh, and of course, the soil testing I talked about earlier, that can be obtained at soiltesting.tamu.edu. Uh, you can always call the extension. We have master gardeners uh, that man the telephones and uh, they will answer your questions or find you an answer to your questions. Uh, of course, we're located on Airport Road across from the convention center. So uh, come out and see our gardens any any time. And I thank you for joining us today. Uh,
And as I say, if you've got questions, go to uh, uh, our phone and give them a call. And if they don't know the answers, they'll call me and we'll, we'll get your answers taken care of. So thank you for joining us. Thank <laughs> you.